equal to i, then you have what is called the unnormalized operation, just d minus w. The random walk operation that is related to transition probability of random walk on the graph, it's just choosing a to be the degree matrix. Okay? Let's talk about spectral properties of manifolds and maps. So first let's start with manifolds. Basically, if you look at the operation on a manifold, assuming that the manifold is compact, it has countably many eigenfunctions. There will be infinitely many, but basically you can enumerate them. They will look like this. So enumerate them with some, with some integer index i. The eigenfunctions are real and they're orthonormal due to self enjoyedness. The eigenvalues are non negative due to positive self indefiniteness. For the graph, it will be exactly the same. So you can write it as eigenequalization problem of this form. Right? Phi here is a matrix of size n by n containing the eigenvectors of the operation as columns, lambda is a diagonal matrix containing the corresponding eigenvalues. And Basically, you usually pose it as a generalized identity problem, which produces A orthogonal eigenvectors, vectors that are orthogonal with respect to this matrix A. Okay, we assume that it's strictly positive diagonal, so this is, it's uh, positive indefinite, it's positive definite in the problem. You can also change the variables, define psi equals to A squared of phi, and you get a standard eigen problem with orthogonal eigen psi equals to i. Okay, and when you use a equals to e, then you get this, this system of coordinates, you get an operation that is called normalized symmetric operation. Okay, so it can be obtained as this kind of operation can be obtained as a particular case, the definitions that we've seen before. Okay, let's give some physical interpretation of eigenvectors and eigenvalues of manifolds and graphs. This is a historical experiment that was done by Ernst Skladny, who worked in the beginning of the 19th century. Basically, he tried to visualize why certain musical instruments sound better than other ones. Basically, he published these three guys on the theory of sounds. Basically, the experiment he did is depicted in this picture. He took a wooden plate, applied to it acoustic vibrations using a violin bow, and on the plate he put a thin layer of sand. Basically he saw that at different frequencies the sand formed different patterns. Can you hear the sound? So this is the modern reproduction of this experiment of Ernst Kladi. Basically what happens here? So you can somehow intuitively imagine that at some frequencies there form standing waves. Where basically there are some points where the grain, basically when the wave goes up and down, right? It's time dependent signal. There are some points where basically it has a zero crossing. So at this point, the grains of sand do not jump. These are exactly the contours that you can see in this, in this picture. So let's see what happens. Basically, the behavior of the wave in this case is governed by the wave equation that we've seen before. So how do you solve the wave equation? The standard technique is separation of variables. We assume that the solution can be written as a product of the spatial part and the temporal part. We call it phi and tau. If you plug it into the equation, after some manipulation, we get something like this. <coughs> Second derivative of tau over tau equals to the operation of phi over phi. And this should be equal for all x and all t, which are independent. So it means that it's constant. Let's call this constant minus number. If you look at the spatial part of the solution, this side, we get that it looks like this. This is called the physical Helmholtz equation, and it's exactly the formula that we use to define the function of the equation. So the spatial part of the, of the wave that solves the wave equation are eigenfunction of the equation. Basically, what we observe in this experiment are zero crossings or the nodal sets of the operation eigenfunction of the domain. Okay. So you interpret the eigenfunction of the operation as some vibration modes and the eigenvalues as resonance frequencies. Another important thing, also coming from physics, is what is called the Dirichlet energy. So basically it's a kind of criterion that tells you how, 
how significantly the function changes over the domain. Okay. So if you write it on a manifold, we can write it like this. So it's an integral over the norm squared of the gradient of f. Now, when I say norm here, actually I refer to the norm that arises from the domain metric right? It's at each point of the manifold. So you can write it as inner product, okay, the domain metric of the gradient of f in itself. Okay? In other words, that's the inner product of the gradient with itself when the inner product is taken as the inner product of the space of angular vector fields. Now I will use the fact that the gradient is a joint minus the variance operator. I will move this gradient here, replacing it with the joint operator. I get minus the variance of the gradient, which is nothing else but our well familiar operation. So what is written here is an integral of f delta f. Okay, so it's a kind of quadratic form. On the graph we can write it in this way. This is quadratic form f transpose delta f. <coughs> so if you want to find the smoothest orthonormal basis, so let's say that you are looking for some functions from c0 to psi k minus 1. Okay, if we want to minimize the Dirichlet energy, Okay, and orthonormality means that all the functions have unit norm. Okay, so the smoothest one will be just the eigenfunction that minimizes the Dirichlet energy. The second eigenfunction will be the one that minimizes the Dirichlet energy and also orthonormal, orthogonal to the previous one. Okay, so basically the i function will be will have a unit norm and will be orthogonal to the previous ones. The solution of this problem will be the k first operation of functions. You can actually easily see it. Right? Basically, if you write the operation of the operation using its spectral decomposition, you will see that here we get the smallest dish energy, we need to take the smallest eigenvalue. And we know that the smallest eigenvalue of the operation is zero, so actually the smallest <laughs> possible dish energy is zero, and you will get the first eigenfunction as the first function in your basis. And in the same way you will choose an eigenfunction that is lambda 1. It will be the first uh, function in the expansion that is orthogonal to the constant one in the first eigenfunction and has the corresponds to the smallest eigenvalue and so on and so forth. On the graph you can write it in this way. So you write the Dirichlet energy for the entire basis as trace of psi transpose the output psi with orthogonality constraint. Okay, this is how the eigenfunction is like. So on the Euclidean domain, one dimensional or the eigenfunctions of one dimensional Euclidean notation are the standard Fourier your basis. Basically sines or cosines up to phase shift. Okay. This is how the eigenfunctions look on the manifold. This is how they look on the graph. You can Take a non Euclidean domain, whether it's a manifold or a graph, complete its notation. If you work with a discrete structure, it will be represented as a big sparse matrix. Compare these eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and you get an orthogonal basis. Okay. Now, what, why orthogonal basis is important? Orthogonal basis are used in harmonic analysis and signal processing to represent signals. So, this is called free analysis. So, in classical signal processing, this is bread and butter. If you take a function, let's say, that lives on an interval between minus pi and pi, and you can decompose into basis functions that in this case are sines or cosines at different frequency. Right? So how do you decompose? You just project your function on this orthogonal basis. So these are called Fourier coefficients or the foreign Fourier transform. And basically you take these coefficients, multiply the basis functions, these complex exponentials, sign them up. Or in the continuous case, we'll make an integral, and this is called the inverse Fourier transform, right? So, or analysis and synthesis. Now, where do these basis functions come from? These are again functions of the rotation operator. Euclidean one dimensional rotation operator is just second order derivative. So, the generalization to a manifold or a graph looks completely straightforward. You just replace your complex exponentials with orthogonal eigenfunctions of the rotation, and the the analogy of frequencies are the eigenvalues. Okay. All the rest looks exactly the same. Now, the, basically the reason 
need for which Fourier analysis was first proposed by these gentlemen. Do you know, by the way, the history of Fourier? So for most of his career, he wasn't a scientist, he was a politician, he was the mayor of Grenoble. He basically he somehow started accompanying Napoleon to one of his campaigns in Egypt <coughs> as a scientist. And then Napoleon gave him, a, made him a proposal that he couldn't refuse to join his administration. And he struggled with his inability to refuse to, to, to his boss and his uh, willingness to science. So this was actually done before his administrative career and published something like 20 years after. So this is the, the first page of the, of the book of Fourier, that had the, the, the analytic theory of heat, where he described what today is known as Fourier series. Okay, basically the main application was solving heat equations. <coughs> in his case, in his time, only PDF domains. But basically it looks exactly the same way on only PDF domains as well. So I remind you this is the heat equation. You just use the right operation basically to define it on, on your domain, whether it's a graph or a manifold, whatever you want. This is the initial condition, so that's the heat distribution at point zero. And the way that you solve the heat equation is applying what is called heat operator, which is the exponent of the operation, e to minus t operation, where the exponent is understood as the exponent of the operator, although you take an exponent of a matrix or an operator. You do eigenvalues, you apply the exponentiation to the eigenvalues, right? So let's do exactly this. Basically, you, we now translate everything to the, to the frequency domain, right? To the, to the frequency domain. So these, these are the Fourier coefficients of F0, right? initial heat distribution. These are the exponentiated eigenvalues of the operation. And here we synthesize back. So if you have to write it in the matrix, it will look like this, right? Basically, you apply e to minus t delta point zero, you apply F transpose at zero, right? This is what is written here. And then you exponentially the eigenvalues. And then you do the synthesis. What is written here. So let's write this inner product explicitly as an integral and exchange the position of the sum and the integration. This function here is called the heat kernel or the fundamental solution of the equation. So basically it's a function that depends on the time parameter and two points x and x prime. Okay, so basically you can think of it as uh, an impulse response to a delta initial condition. Okay. This is how the heat kernel will look like at different points of the main frame. This is how it would look on the graph. So this is by the way broad graph in the state of Minnesota. <coughs> okay. So this is the solution of the heat equation of the manifold that is expressed in the notation basis. In the Euclidean case, I remind you, the, the basis functions are complex exponentials. So I just plug in plug them in into this equation. Right? I just replaced my phi i's with these e's. Now, the exponentials have associativity properties, so I can combine these two terms into one, and you see that the heat kernel now depends not on x and x prime, but on the difference between x and x prime. This makes it shift in right. So, what is written here is a convolution of f0 with ht. So, this is the interpretation of heat kernel as an impulse response, speaking in terms of signal processing. So basically, if you initialize your heat as a delta function at a point, what will be the solution of the heat equation after a certain time? In the Euclidean case, it doesn't depend on the position. So the solution will be exactly the same. If you shift your initial condition, the solution will shift by the same amount. In the non-Euclidean case, it's not true anymore. You don't have any shift in the Okay, so let's talk about convolution. We are finally getting to the main topic. Deep learning, right? Convolution in neural networks are based on the operation that is called convolution. So we need to understand what is actually convolution. So this is convolution. We've seen it before, right? Convolution of f and g is written as this integral. And shift invariance is the basic property that you have in the Euclidean space. Meaning that 
if you shift one of the functions that you convolve by x0, it will be equivalent to shifting the output by x0. The conversion operator commutes with the operation, or with dv by dv general. If you take the operation of f convolved with g, it's the same as applying the operation to f convolution with g. Mm -hmm. And the most important result in signal processing that is actually what created the moderate signal processing is what is called the convolution theorem. It's the fact that convolution is diagonalized, the convolution operator is diagonalized by the Fourier transform. Not only convolution, any topless operator or third country operator. Mm -hmm. And basically it means that the convolution can be computed in the Fourier transform. So basically the Fourier transform, you can think of it as a change of coordinates where convolution just becomes element-wise product. So expressed mathematically, conversion theory tells that the product of Fourier transforms of F and G is equal to the Fourier transform of their convolution. And basically, because in the Euclidean domain we can compute conversions efficiently using f of t, the analog and complexity, filtering convolution of f with g becomes very efficient. So after the invention or the reinvention of the Fourier transform or of the fast Fourier transform by Cooley and Tuke, basically this is the beginning of modern signal processing, late 60s or 70s. We'll see that on graphs in the manifolds, actually, we don't have, in most cases, this function. Okay, let's just see it in the discrete case. Convolution of two vectors, f and g, right? Let's we can represent g as this toplets or circular matrix multiplied by the vector f. So circular matrix diagonalized by the Fourier basis. You can write it like this. Okay, so these are the eigenvalues of g in the Fourier basis. You have the diagonal matrix with g hat, the Fourier transform of g. And if you transpose f, is the Fourier transform of f, right? So basically, the multiplication of diagonal matrix by a vector is just diagonal matrix containing the, like this, the diagonal matrix containing the, this product. Okay, so, sorry, so the matrix, it should be a vector containing this product. A vector containing the product. You have to target a second one. Where? It should be G1, G0, G1. Yeah. So two bytes here, it should be G0, and this should be a column vector, not a diagonal matrix. Okay. I apologize, that's actually a good thing. I don't need to, to record it, so just... <laughs> so it's good to give this tutorial, so I can correct myself. Okay, basically on the non Euclidean domains, mm -hmm. manifolds and graphs, we don't have shift invariants, so we don't have convolution theorem. But we can use the convolution theorem itself mm -hmm. properly as a definition. So we can define convolution as a product of the Fourier transforms of f and g. In this case, Fourier transforms will be just projections of f on the basis of the operation, on the autonomous basis phi. And in this discrete setting, we can just write it like this. <laughs> if you transpose f, right, that's the Fourier transform of, of f, multiplied by the diagonal matrix containing the Fourier transform of g, and then see this multiplication by phi from the left. And of course, the property that we gave up with is it's not shift invariant. Basically, this matrix g doesn't have any circular structure anymore. It's still commutes with the operation, so this is a nice property. What is very important that these filter coefficients mm -hmm. depend on the basis. So if I change my domain, these bases will usually change. And as a result, the representation of the filter will also change. Let me give you an example. So this is a function that I plot on the manifold. Okay, just some blobs. Okay. This is a filter that is applied to this function represented in this way. Okay? It does some kind of edge detection. Now I take an approximately isometric domain with the same function applying the same filter. Okay? And I get a totally different result. Why? Because the basis here changed. It has a location that is not exactly equal. It's not exactly isometric. The eigenbasis of its notation is different. I use the same filter coefficients to apply to this function, I get a very different result. 
So you see basically a problem of transferring the filter from one domain to another. This will be a major problem of spectral convolutional neural network techniques that you will see in the, in the following. Okay? If you don't mind, give me a 15 minutes break. I need to bring something and we'll continue. Finally, talking about spectral scans.